Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The greatest happiness of life is the conviction that we are loved, loved for ourselves, or rather loved in spite of ourselves. Victor Hugo. Love is an irresistible desire to be irresistibly desired. Robert Frost. Being deeply loved by someone gives you strength, while loving someone deeply gives you courage. Lao Tzu. There is only one happiness in this life, to love and be loved. George Sand. Love is composed of a single soul inhabiting two bodies. Aristotle. Or here are maybe some slogans or little catchy phrases about love you might have heard. All you need is love. Love has no borders. Make love, not war. Loving you is what I do. Love is the answer. Love is the key to happiness. Those are some rather beautiful words that people have said about love. And if you think about it, many of the best songs and movies and TV shows ultimately are about love. Some great love story, some epic romance between two individuals is what drives a lot of those stories that many of us like to read or watch. Well, today in the scriptures, we are reading one of the great, if not the greatest, love chapter in the scriptures from 1 John chapter 4, our epistle reading for today. And it almost begs the question, because love is so prominent in our world, because it's talked about so much and sung about so often and quoted about pretty much all the time, what sort of love is being spoken of here? What sort of love is being brought to us in the scriptures in 1 John chapter 4? Well, in order to really answer that question, we have to look at the word love itself. In the English language, we basically only have that one word to describe the feeling of love, love. And if we're going to qualify it, we qualify it by using additional words like brotherly love, or romantic love, or erotic love, and so forth. But the word, the root word, stays the same. Which leads to some confusion, doesn't it? Because that word can be used in so many different ways and in so many different degrees. Here are just a few phrases that you may have said or maybe you've heard. I love chocolate. I love studying history. I almost put I love math, but I don't think anybody says that. I love you. I love my friends. I love my family. We're using the same word in all of those sentences, but we kind of know that that's not referring to the same sort of love in every case. Right? When you say you love chocolate, you're not saying that you love chocolate the same way you love your mother or the same way you love your wife. And you're not even saying that you love your friends the same way that you love your wife or your husband. Right? We sort of know, even though the word is the same, we're describing something different. So it begs the question for our scripture reading today from 1 John chapter 4, what sort of word is being used here? Because in Greek, there are multiple words to express the English word love. There are four main ones. Some people argue seven. But there's one in particular that is used today in our scripture reading. And that word is agape, or agape, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And primarily in our, in our chapter of scripture today, it's used in its verbal form agapeo which means to love. But it has a more specific meaning than that. This isn't simply the Greek word for love as the English word represents. Its specific meaning is this. Agape is selfless or unconditional love. 
sometimes even called God love. Now you might be thinking, why belabor this point about language? Well, the first part of our reading from 1 John emphasizes the importance of truth. And it tells us that we need to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. In other words, there are, very, there are a lot of competing spirits in the world about the way things ought to be. And this applies to the word love. We've all seen the word love applied to something that we would probably not agree is love. And at the very least, we've seen it used in many different ways. So we are to test the spirits to see whether these understandings of love come from God. These words of love come from God. Now some of those get fairly close, right? The first one I read, the greatest happiness of life is the conviction that we are loved, loved for ourselves, or rather loved in spite of ourselves. That starts to get a little close to our understanding of love, right? That we're loved by God in spite of ourselves, despite our sinfulness. But it isn't fully there. And our reading today from 1 John makes it clear why the world never quite gets it completely right when it comes to love. And we know this to a certain degree, right? Many of us have been led astray by the world's definitions of love. Here's just a few examples. Maybe you've been led astray through the perversion of erotic love outside of the context it was given in the scriptures in marriage between a man and a woman. Or maybe you have idolized romantic love, that it is the end-all, be-all, and that it will solve all of your problems. Those are just a couple of the common ones, but the list is almost infinite in the number of ways that the spirits of this world who don't come from God have led us astray when it comes to love. And we are all, you and me, tempted to follow those spirits when it comes to love. After all, everyone desires love. Nobody doubts that love is important. Right? The only people who would say that they don't believe in love are people who've experienced extraordinary suffering at the hands of love itself. And verse 7 of our reading agrees that love is important. So even as Christians, we understand that love is important. It says this, for love is from God. Because it is important, we should be clear about what kind of love God has for us. In fact, that sort of love is central to our understanding of the gospel itself. It is the driving force, the motivating factor that is revealed to us from the scriptures as to why God did what he did in Jesus. So, this love is amazing and unbelievable. It's unconditional and limitless in its application to you. So how do you find it? How do we find this love? Well, the answer from the text is twofold. The first way that we find this love is in truth. Our reading starts with in truth. right? And it says that the truth is defined by those things that come from our Savior, Jesus Christ. That those things which confess that he has come in the flesh and paid the price for our sin, those things are from God and they are true. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And the second point that our text makes is that we don't find it. We don't find it. God brings it to us. The love of God is not something we set out on a pilgrimage or an extraordinary adventure to go and find. In fact, God sets out on an extraordinary adventure to bring that love to us. And he does so in Jesus. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loves us and sent his son to be, to be the propitiation for our sins. How amazing is that? 
the best love there is in all the universe, which finds its source in God. He doesn't require us to be worthy of or to search for, but he does the work to bring it to us. And now that we have it, oh joyous day, right? We're in the season of Easter. We've experienced the victory of this love in Jesus' death and his resurrection from the dead. And now that we have this love, now that we believe it by the gracious gift of faith through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what do we do with it? Do we just revel in that joy and keep it to ourselves? No. The text tells us, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And remember, this love, every time the word love is used in this chapter, it is agape. That selfless, unconditional love that comes from God. Now, because this love comes from God and is brought to us, not something we generate within ourselves or are able to find on our own, it is only a love those of faith, faith in Jesus, are able to do. There are many forms of love as we understand it that those who do not believe are able to do. But this special, specific kind of love, a selfless, unconditional love, which finds its source in God and is brought to you and me in Jesus, can only be practiced by those of faith. Now let me explain. Even now, you and I cannot generate this love. Even now. The reason that you are possessing of this love, the reason that you are able to carry out this sort of love is because you have received the Holy Spirit of God. It comes from Him. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from you. It comes from Him alone. And we are only able to carry out that sort of love because we have first been loved in that exact manner. Think about that for a moment. It makes sense. Right? What happened to our love in sin? It became corrupted by selfish desire. It became bent and twisted to serve our needs. And the Bible teaches us that no matter how noble the outside of that love looks like, it is always tainted in some way by sin. Whether it's a sin for wanting to appear as noble, whether it's a sin of putting your own needs before the person that you're doing the loving act for. The scriptures are clear that only selfless love comes from God. And now, by the grace of Jesus, from those whom he has called to be his children, those from whom he has come to bring that love and put it in us by the grace of his Holy Spirit. You see, now, you and I, we have a means to fight against corruption of sin and our sinful desires when it comes to love. Now we have a means to fight against that sinful flesh which still clings so tenaciously to us. And that is the new spirit of God that dwells in each and every one of us by the grace of Jesus. This is the source of our ability to love in the agape love sense. In the the selfless, unconditional way. And it really is an amazing thing. Think about it for a moment. What are you afraid of now that you know that the most powerful being in all the universe is also the one who loves you unconditionally? And he proved that unconditional love for you that while you were still a sinner, not even looking for him or his love, he sent Jesus to bring that love to you by paying the price for your sins on the cross. And granting you new life in his resurrection. That is an amazing love. That is an unbelievable love and it is yours. And because it is yours, you no longer need to be afraid. The text tells us there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Your love and my love is far from perfect it's, in fact, it's laden with fears. But the love you have received from God and Jesus is perfect. 
It is not laden with fear. It does what the text describes. It drives your fear away. Your fear of being judged for your mistakes and sins. Your fear of how others look at you. Gone. Because the one who matters most looks at you and sees a perfect child of God washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what greater witness to our God is there than loving in this unique way that only He can do? And now, because of Him, we are able to do as well. We can reflect a completely unique love that is found nowhere else in the entire world apart from Jesus. And so we reflect His love for us. This is what people are looking for. This is what we hope for, knowing that we live in a broken state. And it is found in Jesus. Just as you and I, once in our own sin, had to have this love brought to us in Jesus, so do all of those who do not believe in him. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Now, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you see that the love that God is and bears for you in Jesus, it is this selfless, unconditional, agape love. It is the cure for your fears your self-doubts. It is the cure for the fear of the accusation of Satan and the law. For now, the condemnation of the law has been removed because of this perfect love born for you in Jesus. No longer do you fear your sin, your mistakes, nor even your death. For it has been swallowed up in the victory of the love of Jesus. This love has been perfected By Jesus for you, you are loved by God in spite of your sins and mistakes. But dear brothers and sisters, our work is not done. We live in a world dominated by sin and fear. Just look around. We live in a world where people at best feel that they have to be worthy of love in order to receive it. And at worst, are abused by love's sinful twistings and corruption. So were we. But thanks be to God for Jesus Christ our Lord, who has brought this perfect love of God to us. And may that faith in that perfect love that you have received, that faith in Christ, fuel your ability and mine to love others in this unique way and bear the reflection of our Savior wherever we go. So that others who now, at this point, do not yet know Him, who do not yet know the joy of this love, may see a reflection of it in you and me, and come to know Jesus and His perfect love for them, the forgiveness of their sins, and the driving out of all of their fears. May God equip us, and continually fuel us with his perfect love to carry out this task. In the name of Jesus, amen.